All right, welcome everyone. I'm Carolyn Jacobs with GBH Education, speaking to you from my home in Southern Maine. We have a very, very rich presentation this evening and we are humbled by the number of teachers who registered and many of whom will come to the live stream like you and uh, many of you will be watching the recording. This is the second webinar in a, in a four part series around US history and the new US history collection of resources on PBS learning media, which you will hear a little bit more about later in the program. The camera and the microphone are reserved for the presenters. We invite you to be active in the chat. Of course, many of you submitted questions ahead of time. I have shared those questions with the presenters and they've done their best to incorporate uh, much of what you asked about into their sessions. Feel free to post questions in the chat though. We have reserved some time at the end. We are gonna be online until about 8.30 and we'll have time for some Q&A then. And then our um, featured speaker, Lori Halls Anderson, has generously offered to um, kind of continue answering questions. Um, I will be sending her questions that we were not able to get to, and she is willing to uh, video her responses, and then we'll share that video with you. So that is a very generous offer. We are sponsored by the Education Department of GBH Boston. GBH is the Boston PBS station and the producer of many of the iconic series that you see on your local public media station. Um, series such as American Experience, Frontline, Masterpiece, Nova, lots of programs for kids, and the ever popular Antiques Roadshow. In the education department, we research and work with teachers and experts to produce digital resources for all grades, pre-K to 12 and families. And all of our work is offered complimentary. We are public media after a while. After all, everything is free. We're also sponsored in addition to GBH Education we're sponsored by PBS Learning Media, which is a free platform of thousands of supplemental digital resources for all grades across the curriculum. Here you will find short video clips, like three to five minutes. You will find lesson plans, interactives, documents, audio files, et cetera, thousands of resources for you to explore, very easy ways to search, save, and share. Uh, resources that you find. GBH manages PBS Learning Media in partnership with PBS, and this is where we publish all of the resources that we produce. And when we get to uh, discussing the new U.S. history collection towards the end of uh, this evening, this, this is where you will find those resources. The site is very strong in social studies, in part due to the hundreds of resources that are drawn from American experience. This webinar is also a collaboration uh, with NCSS, the National Council for the Social Studies, and Larry Pasca, who is the executive director, has a uh, couple of words of welcome. Thank you, Larry, nice to see you. Great to see you too, Carolyn. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to know that you're all together tonight for this outstanding program. I'm Larry Pasca, Executive Director of National Council for the Social Studies. We are proud to partner with GBH Education and PBS Learning Media on this program tonight. We're excited to be back with Lori Hall Sanderson. Um, so again, just can't be excited enough that you're here with us this evening. I'm coming to you from Silver Spring, Maryland, where our offices are. And uh, as Carolyn has on the screen here, we also have many opportunities for you to connect with us beyond tonight. We invite you at any time to visit us at socialstudies.org, learn more about membership, 
come to our free Summer Leadership Institute. This is for members, so join and become a member if you're not one already. Um, and you can participate in our institute this summer focused on advocacy and building your voice as a social studies professional. We'll be back at the end of the webinar with a, some special uh, information about our upcoming conference, so please stay for that. And again, just delighted to be with you. Thank you for all you're doing to promote inquiry and raising your voice for social studies education. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you, Larry. And we um, love our work with, with NCSS. All right, the presenters tonight. Um, Alicia, Sue, and Lindsay are all part of the social studies team at GBH Education. All have very deep experience in the classroom, social studies classroom. And Alicia, in fact, is still in the classroom. She's a full-time teacher, and I think she probably taught today. She's winding down, I think, early next week. Um, they are all passionate about sharing resources and strategies to support your teaching of US history. And then we have Jean. Jean is a graduate of Ithaca College, Columbia University. She earned a second master's from Salem State in school library education. And she was a fifth grade teacher in New York before coming to Massachusetts where she is a school librarian in Newton. We are thrilled to have three, um, I think we have three, we had one uh, illness, so we may only have two, but we hope to have three students with us. They are all 11th grade. Anaya um, is the first one pictured, um, Isatu and Bethlehem. And they will be leading the conversation with uh, Lori Halls Anderson, along with Alicia facilitating. And now we have Lori Halls Anderson, a New York Times best-selling author known for tackling tough subjects with humor and sensitivity. Her new book, Shout, is a memoir in verse about surviving sexual assault at the age of 13 and a manifesto for the Me Too era. Among her many awards, two of her books, Speak and Chains, were National Book Award finalists, two more books, The Impossible Knife of Memory and Shout, were long listed for the National Book Awards. She has been honored for her battles for intellectual freedom by the National Coalition Against Censorship and the National Council of Teachers of English. Lori has been nominated for Sweden's Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award seven times, which Lori considers one of her greatest honors. And if you're trying to remember, the what where you heard that name, Astrid Lindgren, think Pippi Longstocking. And I'd like to say how grateful we are to have the opportunity to get to know Lori and bring her experience and expertise to you this evening. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> So we have a, um, a very straightforward agenda. We're mm -hmm. going to um, have some more introductory remarks uh, by Alicia, who's gonna re uh, reference back to the pre-webinar activity that some of you participated in. Uh, Lori is going to introduce herself, and then we're going to have the students and Alicia and Lori be on camera for um, a Q&A and a very rich conversation. Then Sue Wilkins will come on, um, excuse me, before Sue, we have Jean and Lindsay, and they are going to uh, showcase some strategies and resources to teach, his, to teach with historical fiction in the classroom. And then Sue will come on and um, give you a, a sneak peek at the new US History Collection on PBS Learning Media that will be fully launched this summer. I've, I neglected to mention that Angelica from our team is in the chat monitoring things. And also you are going to have links if you haven't already, because Angelica is very diligent about posting links in the chat. You're going to have links to a resource folder that includes, it's amazing, the uh, Gene, the librarian, and Lori and our team put together documents of resources that expand on the topic. Uh, the slide deck will also be available to you, and of course, the recording. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Carolyn. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I let's return to the opening activity and review some of the comments many of you dropped in the chat. And I was thoroughly entertained and excited because you all were right on the money. If I do mispronounce your name, please forgive me, but I do want to give you a shout out um, and kind of a thank you for participating in the in the chat. Um, so Edie Burke says, hey, most of it <laughs> with a smile. Lauren Lemon says the Declaration of Independence. Definitely, they could see referenced um, in this uh, excerpt. Um, we also have Edie Burke, once again, all men being born free and equal was huge. Caitlin White says equality. Brian Parker, life, liberty, property. Lots of John Locke's ideas. Uh, Cheryl Lindstrom says free and equal, certain natural rights. Um, Eric wanted to highlight all men. Caitlin White, human rights. Um, Anita Peaser, my student who's out there, said equality, rights. Um, we have Cheryl Lindstrom that also uh, referenced all men. Uh, I love it that Erica, um, Eric Henderson, excuse me, um, identified unalienable rights. We have uh, free and equal rights, enjoying and defending life and liberty, safety and happiness. Um, Barbara Lazar kind of pointed out the protecting property part. Um, and it goes kind of on and on. Uh, many of us, like I said, we hit it right on the money. So ladies and gentlemen, why did we start out like this? You all were spot on. These are the same themes, phrases, and vocabulary that we use in our classroom to teach this era in history. Some of you may even use this actual document that sounds almost like a direct plagiarized version of the Declaration of Independence or works of John Locke. However, many of us may not know the story behind the text. Um, can you go on to the next slide? And if you really want to appreciate this text, you have to know all right, the story of Elizabeth Freeman, AKA Mom Bet. Um, so Mom Bet, she was born in 1742. And I actually did see someone in the chat actually reference it, which I was so excited. She was born in 1742 to enslaved African parents in Claverlook, New York. Her husband was actually killed while fighting in the Revolutionary War. She's an amazing woman because she sued her owner after um, her, one of her enslavers hit her with a heated um, kitchen, kitchen shovel. And what I admire about her is that she used the same language that she had actually heard white men that she had served um, supporting democracy and natural rights. So she used that language to empower and make a case for why she herself should also be free. Her court case was known as Brown versus Bett versus Ashley. It was argued before a county court, court and the jury in fact ruled in favor of Bett and Brown making them the first enslaved African-Americans to be freed under the Massachusetts constitution of 1780. This municipal case set a precedent and led to the abolition of slavery in Massachusetts. So, you know, here we are, we have this remarkable woman, um, this enslaved woman who was able to use the same rhetoric used during the revolution to secure her own freedom and the freedom of all enslaved black people in her state. In essence, I like to argue, if you will, that she actually helped the state of Massachusetts really move to live up to the ideals of the American Revolution. But unfortunately, stories about people like Elizabeth Freeman aren't told as much as they should in the classrooms across the country. But luckily, we have books like Lori Hall Anderson's Chains that can bring to life the story of so many people like Elizabeth Freeman. Young adult historical fiction can provide a captivating window into the experiences of unknown people. Next slide. And this is our purpose. This is exactly why we're here tonight. We're here for this evening to actually um, explore how can we use historical fiction as a resource in our classrooms to help tell the stories of unheard groups and communities. Specifically, our objective for this evening is by the end of the webinar, we hope that participants will have a series of ready to use tools, strategies, and middle grade and young adult historical fiction titles for the classroom. Next slide. Well, before um, Ms. Anderson gives us some introductory remarks, I'd love to just kind of stress why, why change, right? There's a lot of other young adult books that we could use to kind of get our point across, right? However, I love change. And one of the reasons why 
it was my first year of teaching in DC and a little bit of information about myself. I am this is my, going on my 23rd ish year. They all kind of run together after a while. Um, and I came to DC to teach about 13 years ago. And I remember my first class that I had in my first group of students, I had just finished teaching a lesson on Northern slavery. And some students had stayed behind because they wanted to talk more about the lesson. And I was giving them some suggestions for books. And one of my students had asked me, well, those are all great, but have you read Chains? And like so many of us educators, particularly us that are in the crowd right now, I know you all know what I mean, to stay face, and to never have to acknowledge that my students might know something I didn't, I said, yeah, of course, I read it. Did you really read it? All along, I had never read it. I had never even heard of it, right? Um, and the reason why I hadn't was because I was a book snob. I thought that because it was a young adult you know, fiction, it was beneath me. And no shade to Team Edward or Jacob out there, those of you that love Twilight, but I thought it was gonna be like a book along the lines of Twilight about slavery. And I really kind of wasn't feeling it at the time. Man, was I wrong. I was so wrong. If you speed up to a few years later, I was, you know, in the library, the school's library, and I was, I was looking for a book to read for pleasure, and I came across it. And I was like, wow, I remember so many of my students had read it, and they were going on and on and on about it. And when I took it home, it was a page turner. I could not put it down. And to this very day, I regret not reading it a lot sooner. Not only did I find myself thoroughly enjoying it, I found myself taking notes on the experiences of the enslaved young men and women that were highlighted um, in the book during the American Revolution. She was able to teach me things that even I myself did not necessarily know about that era in time. It's made such a big impact on how I teach and what I teach about the American Revolution that I know that this book could be a great introduction and can do the same for you. So um, now we're gonna have Lori Halls Anderson give us some introductory remarks. Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Alicia. I have to admit I'm in the middle of my new historical novel now. And, and so that and all the kind words in the chat are kind of filling me up. And I really needed that. Thank you to all of you for putting in another impossibly hard year. I hope that you can get a chance to get, catch some breath this summer. Um, you uh, are the backbone of our country. You are teaching the leadership and the citizens of the next generation. And that's why we especially now need to make sure we are doing it in an honorable and accurate and loving way. I, I love our country. I have some things that I would love to see improved. Uh, the teaching of social studies, the understanding of civics, the understanding of government and our opportunities and uh, responsibilities to be informed voters are pretty high on my list. Um, and I have to say, I came to uh, American history because I loved, actually, I came to American history, you guys, because I'm really nosy and I love gossip. I think that social studies is really the study of gossip, at least the way that I read it. Next slide, please. Um, this was my first historical fiction book, Fever 1793, um, because I heard about the, the yellow fever epidemic that hit Philadelphia, then the U.S. Capitol in 1793, and I, it was a really disgusting epidemic, and I love discussing medical things along with gossip, so I was like, oh, I have to learn about this, um, and it wound up being a great opportunity to write a story not only about uh, an epidemic, by the way, yes, this works really well in terms of the historical uh, mirror of, of an epidemic of a disease that people don't understand, how people, some people react amazingly well, some people are, are bounded by fear, um, and it's, it's historical and there's really great food and gossip in there. Um, but when I was researching this book, I learned something about one of my heroes that changed me, completely changed my, the career trajectory I thought I was gonna have and changed me as an American, next slide. It was about the guy I would have dated if he had gone to my high school, Benjamin Franklin. I've always held him up as my favorite founding father. Nobody told me when I was doing the, uh, the hero worship that in addition to all the great things about Benjamin Franklin, he also held people in slavery his entire adult life and made money when slaves, um, slaves who had liberated themselves were advertised as runaways in newspapers if they were returned. Uh, Franklin, because of his newspaper, would get some of the reward money. 
I actually did some research. There's a wonderful article I've referenced here by Gary B. Nash. These are the names of some of the people we know primary source evidence for that Franklin held in slavery. And I was so confused because he was the first president of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society and he was still a slave owner and an enslaver. And I realized I knew nothing, nothing about the institution of slavery in terms of the uh, founding of America, uh, founding of the United States. I was always looking at it through the lens of the Civil War. I'm a white lady raised in the North and Northerners have a really bad habit, I feel, of looking at slavery through that Civil War lens because it allows us, especially the white people, to say, oh, well, we didn't have slavery, so, and we won the Civil War, so let's move on. The truth is, is my research showed me that uh, the slavery is the American institution. It's not the African American institution. Um, everything in our in, in our history is uh, touched by this holding of families in chattel slavery uh, for hundreds of years. Not yeah, it was hundreds of years, wasn't it? Next slide, please. So I could not have written Chains or any of the other historical books I've written without my wonderful editor, Kevin Lewis. Kevin was my editor on Fever 1793. And he was the person that I had a conversation with about Ben Franklin. And we talked about slavery. We actually wound up having long conversations about our country for months and months and months. Um, and Kevin, uh, I could not have written Chains without him as my editor, he's a black man. Uh, whose experience in life uh, was very different than mine, obviously. Um, but we were a great team and uh, the research took a long time. Next, next slide, please. But eventually I wound up with chains. Um, it was supposed to just be a standalone book. Kevin is a very persuasive editor. He was the one who convinced me to, he said the war was really long. So that's why I wound up writing the other two books, Forge and Ashes. I feel it's so important when we're talking to kids to frame history in a way that they can understand. And frankly, you guys, they don't care about the battle dates. That just doesn't touch them. But if I wanna try to write stories that are accurate, grounded in primary sources, but that reflect the real life experience of normal people, um, nor how did this war affect all kinds of different groups of, then, of early Americans? Um, that was my goal. Next, please. Um, this is the this is the trilogy. Forge is uh, takes up the story after Chains, and it's told by Isabel's friend Corzon, who's a very idealistic young black man who, like thousands and thousands of other black boys and men, signed up for the Patriot Service. Um, they some, some black men fought for the British, others fought for the Patriots. Every Amer every American family at this point had to ask, which side am I going to support? Which side is gonna help my family? And sometimes if you had the army going through your backyard, you would switch sides in a very practical way. Ashes is the final book in the trilogy. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Forge takes place largely at Valley Forge, that winter Valley Forge, which is not far from my house outside Philadelphia. And Ashes looks at the end of the war when the battle moved um, south to Virginia and the Southern states. Um, I know that Johnny Tremaine is the foundational book often uh, of a lot of classes about the American Revolution. And I love that book too. Um, uh, there are some things about the book that the historians in the past, oh golly, 70 years since the book came out, 80 years, have learned so much more um, about the lives of all kinds of different folks from different backgrounds, different uh, economic classes, different political stance. So it's nice, I think every generation of writers has to kind of refresh the American story. Johnny Tremaine is, is a lovely book, um, but there, there are a lot more other ones out there and I think that reflect the current understanding of history. One more, please. Um, and I, I know we're gonna talk about Barbara Stripling. I think somebody is later on, uh, she's from Syracuse, which I'm from Syracuse, so yay, go orange. Um, and she was also the past president of the American Library Association. Her dissertation is based on this very vital question. What is the impact of teaching with historical novels and primary sources on the development of historical empathy. And I want you all to circle that word and write it down in the back of your hands, because until we can present history in a way that will develop historical empathy in the, in the minds and the souls of the people we care about, we can't begin to move forward as a nation. Final slide, please. 
this is what her conclusion was. Um, I'll skip over all the hundreds of pages of awesomeness. Yes, empathy was shown to be a catalyst for understanding in the history in English classrooms through the use of primary sources and historical fiction. Her dissertation is available online um, and I strongly encourage everyone uh, to take a read because you don't have anything else to do with your summer, right? Um, but so that's all I wanted to talk about in my quick introduction. Thank you, Lori. And um, Alicia and the students are gonna come on camera. Very cool. Yes, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and here they are. Nice. Yay. How That's you doing cool. guys? Hello, thank you for having us. Oh, it's so good to see you. Congratulations on making it through another year. You, you have classes tomorrow? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't think you'll have to do very much though. Just roll, can you go to school? In your, are you allowed to go to school in your pajamas? This week, yeah. Good, I was gonna say, if I was I your principal. No, no. anyway. I, you know, I have work pajamas now and I have, I have bed pajamas and I think students should be allowed to have school pajamas. Um, I'll see what I can do about that. All right. So um, because it's so important to, to make sure that we're listening to students um, at least as much, if not more than talking at them, I wanted to open up this conversation by asking you guys a question, um, if, if you don't mind. Um, what do you, how does it, I want to know your feelings about being taught history through textbooks versus learning about history through stories. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Oh, go ahead, buddy. Okay. Um, I would say it made it more engaging and like um, more engaging and more easy to remember. And it, it made it more easier to have conversations with other people about it. I, I could talk to Anaya about a certain chapter and how it got me mad or things like that. It, it was just, it, we were able to build um, build conversations off of it, I would say. Um, for me, I like learning, um, like I like reading. So I will read and I would like to learn from something that way. But like history, I don't know. It's something that not, I don't like just out of a textbook, but like, I like the way Miss Butler teaches. Like, it's not out of a textbook really, but I don't know. I just like the way I learn in that sense. You know, I agree. I feel like with the textbook learning, if I can memorize the date, then that means I'm good at memory. But if I can actually connect to something and connect to historical events, connect them to myself and my world, it means that I'm not only a, a more empathetic person, but also just a better historian. And I think that the idea of, of being able to connect like that at such a young age shows that all of us can be historians as well. I love that, thinking of you guys as historians. Ooh, just gave me the goosebumps. Nicely done. Oh, you, we are, oh, that's, gosh, I've never thought about it that way. How delightful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank All you. right, so we'll, I guess we can go ahead and begin our, our slates of questions from the students, if that's okay. I know that Anaya, you had a question about um, storytelling. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question, Anaya? Okay, so mine was at what point in your life did you first get introduced to storytelling and how did it impact you as a writer? Yeah, I, I imagine that I was hearing stories before I even had words because my dad was one of those dads who just always has the stories, right? Some of you guys know these sorts of dads. They're just, he, and he was a really great storyteller. You know, he had timing, he had pacing and, and he would talk about like his grandparents and stories he heard from his grandparents. And I actually think that that's what part of what I, I started to get interested in history because I wanted to know, well, you know, what was the world, what was this country, this corner of the world like when my grandparents were young, when my great grandparents were young, why did they come here? How did they get here? 
Um, so that 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 kind of real family connection had everything to do with why I started to en enjoy storytelling and also framed as history. That's great. Isa too, um, I know that you had a question regarding historical fiction that you'd like to ask um, Ms. Anderson. Yes, so as an author, how can historical fiction books inform students of various diverse perspectives that are often overlooked in the classroom? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> and it's important to remember that um, textbooks, I, I don't know much about the making of textbooks and I have a lot of respect for the people who have to put them together. But first of all, they're often put together by committees and we all know how well that goes. Um, and there's all this arguing and they, the textbooks don't stay updated with historical research very easily. So you could be reading a textbook that was put together, the bulk of it, 20 years ago by people who were educated 40 years earlier. So now, and think about how much this country has grown in the past 20 years in terms of our understanding of our history, of our responsibilities to each other. Um, and, and history is just moving faster now. So, so I think that textbooks, I hope that very soon, especially with organizations like NCSS and the incredible multimedia technologies we have available to us, that we can lessen our old dependence on the textbook. It's time to move past that. Um, Barbara Stripling talks about the you know, inquiry-based models where we give you guys the power to, to do that, you know, kind of like, as you were saying, as a historian, do the, you know, ask the question and then start diving down. And again, in stories, my job is, my job first and foremost is to keep you turning the pages, uh, but to do it in a manner that's responsible, ethical, and based on primary sources, and then to leave you with nonfiction information at the backs. So those of you who are interested in it, you'll just keep running. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but yeah. Um, oh, the perspectives, the point of view. Well, gosh, yeah, 60 years ago. I mean, we're still struggling to get everybody on, on board with, with respecting and honoring and being curious about the perspectives of people from different backgrounds. Um, and I can't think of a more important thing to be doing right now as a nation is to not only learning you know, um, the history, but learning how to listen. I love it. Um, I know that um, Bethlehem, she really loved the, the, the ghosts and their presence in your book. Um, and I know that she had a question regarding that. Um, my question was basically like, what was the inspiration or the use of the ghost in chains? What purpose do you serve technically? Yeah, well, it, you know what, um, I'm going to shout out to the New York Historical Society in, in Manhattan, New York City. Uh, they had an incredible exhibit, I, and I included uh, links to that online exhibit in my um, resources for you guys. Their, their exhibit was about slavery in New York, um, and it was, well, golly, 20 years ago now. Um, and in the beginning of the exhibit, there was this incredible sculpture, and it was made of really thin silver wire. And I walked in and it was just sometimes, you know, that greater spirit is guiding you. That's what it felt like to me. And the way the light was coming through the window, these sculptures were the shapes of a man and a woman, black man and a black woman who were liberating themselves from slavery. And so they're kind of hunched over. They got, they're carrying everything they have in a, in a bag. But here's the thing, that thin, beautiful wire and the sunlight hitting it. If I, if I looked at it straight on, I could see it. But if I moved, it vanished just because of the, of the way the shadows were in the room. And I was just like, it was just like everything crashed on my head. I was just mesmerized. And I realized that there are ghosts. These, there are ghosts everywhere. And that the power structures of, of the United States have worked very, very hard for, two, for 400 years, but 250 years almost since, since we, we formed as a, a nation to eliminate those people to eliminate their stories. They don't want us to know the truth at the foundation of the country, just like they don't want us to know about redlining. They don't want us to know about today's inequities and massive injustices that target people of color more than white people. And to understand how we got here, we have to go back there because it is tied together. So, so it, was, it was that sculpture 
that made me realize for the, again, and when I say I'm, I'm realizing something, that's me going, oh, I, I've learned a little bit more. I've learned a little bit more. There's so much more to learn. Um, but yeah, those ghosts. And that's when actually when I was standing, just to finish your, your, your question, when I was standing in front of that sculpture, that's when the first lines of the book dropped into my head. And I pulled out my notebook, always had that little notebook because I didn't have a fancy phone. And I scribbled down that ghosts like to talk to us just before morning. That's what mama said. Wow, that is so deep. <laughs> um, I said too, I know you had a question about methodology. Yes, so um, I wanted to know what methods you use to make the characters in your book relate to the larger historical events. Well, I want you to think about what it looks like when people are braiding hair, right? Three strands. So, um, and this, re this requires lots and lots of index cards and giant sheets of paper that take up entire walls sometimes. Um, so I have three threads in my story. One is the events that really happen in the time and place that the book um, covers. Number two is figuring out how can my characters interact with those. Those are the exterior challenges to my characters. And then the third strand is the interior life of the character, their feelings, their intellect, their growth, their, their desires, and their fears. And so trying to braid all those together is why it takes so darn long to, to write a book. Um, but I wanted, for example, to set chains in New York City because um, we, so we are largely because of Johnny Tremaine, but there have been a number of other books set in Boston. We focus in the beginning of, of the American Revolution in Boston, and we don't know anything else about the rest of it. And who, not many people knew that New York City was held by the British for almost the entire revolution. Um, it was a loyalist stronghold. And the thought that, um, and then just, so putting it in a new location, having my main character enslaved by loyalists would give me the opportunity to show the loyalist point of view. And Isabel is a very, very smart young woman because she sees the hypocrisy. She hears the hypocrisy and knows that nobody is fighting for her. And I wanted to set up the book in a way that that could be sort of the central focus of her character. I'm glad you actually talked about Isabel because the next question that we have comes from Bethlehem and it's regarding Ruth, mm -hmm. one of the characters. Um, my question about Ruth was like, why exactly was she in inserted? Only, I say that only because I feel like for the most part of the book, she was more so like, how do I write this? She was more so like, almost like a burden because mm -hmm. not only did they have to think about, not only did the main character have to think about um, surviving, right. but in uh, navigating all of this, she also had to think about her younger sister. So yeah, that's my question. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And uh, yeah, burden and responsibility. Um, uh, it must've felt like a burden, um, it did. Uh, so I wanted I wanted a little sister because I know based on the um, existing slave narratives that I read, how important it was for people to, if at all possible, take family members with them and um, and and just, you know, they'd had so much taken from them that you get boiled down to your essence and that's my family. Um, and and family means sometimes biological ties, sometimes it's 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 kin of the heart. Um, which which we get I get into in a later book, but Ruth was really important because she is uh, the responsibility of of our main character Isabel. Uh, Roald Dahl was the person who said in writing books for children, you need to kill the parents off early, <laughs> because if if she was with her parents who are taking who would take incredibly good care of her, then we don't have much of a story. So that's why we don't have any parents. But also, you know, especially in the lives of enslaved children, it was very common for them not to live with their parents or to have been even their parents would be alive, but they would be separated from them. And that's one thing that Isabel is terrified of. I also wanted to have Ruth have epilepsy, which is not how they discussed it. Then they discussed it as the falling sickness, because we've always had people with chronic illnesses. Um, and we've never, you know, in, in all time periods. And so that, that does add to her responsibility and her burdens. Um, it adds to us uh, the superstition that comes in, that came in back then. And it makes, uh, makes Ruth even more vulnerable. Um, 
I, Ruth is becomes, come, I'm not saying anything that you wouldn't know if you read the cover of the book. So Ruth actually comes back into the story in the third book. Um, and she's a very different person then because it's many years later. So that was really, really interesting to develop. Um, I think in some ways, I wish I could write a book about her. Maybe one of you guys could do that for me. I love that. Staying along the lines on the themes of family. Um, I know that Mr. Peaser had a question regarding the relationship with the book and any ties to your family. So this kind of refers to my other question, I believe, but I was saying like, did your family have like any ties to the era that like kind of helped you with wanting to make the book as well? or coming up with any of the ideas that you came up with, things in that sort. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a great question. Um, in my first historical novel, Fever 1793, there's a character of a grandfather in that book. And that character is based, his personality is a lot like my own father's. Um, and the main character's mom is, uh, well, my mom's not with us anymore, so I can say this. Yeah, it's really based on my mom. <laughs> she didn't realize it, thank goodness. Um, but, but for this book, I kind of got that out of my system. Um, my, my mom's family has been, uh, came to the, the United States, came to America very early in the Puritan time period. So that part of the family had a number of soldiers who uh, fought for the revolution, mostly on the Patriot side, some in the uh, Loyalist side. I didn't know this growing up though. I knew it as I started to write the book and I started to do more genealogy. And I told my relatives, I'm like, you guys, this is so cool. We've got these, these, these people who participated and nobody in my family cared. They're like, well, you know what, they're dead. Um, so uh, I think that my, I tend to be, I tend to talk a lot when I get excited about things. So maybe they just didn't want to be bored to death. Um, but I, I did, I think in some way, because my mom's family has been in the United States for so long and I've, I've enjoyed such incredible privilege um, uh, from that, that, you know, being white and, and coming from a family with deep roots. And um, I feel uh, like I have a responsibility to, to try to, you know, walk with honor and create work that will show the broader picture. I love it. Um, the next question that we have, I know, came from uh, Bethlehem, and she was wondering um, about just as far as who do you sympathize with um, in the book? Oh, tell me more about that, Bethlehem. Basically, what Bethlehem said, like, who do you sympathize with? Or, um, yeah, who do you sympathize with? Yeah. Well, can I ask you real quick who you sympathize with? I'm gonna have, to, I think I'm gonna stick to the main character, Isabel. Yeah. I was yeah. gonna say Ruth, but I think it's, I think it's Isabel. Well, we get to know her best, you know? So she had definitely has an unfair advantage, which is why, again, why one of you guys needs to write a book from Ruth's perspective, um, cause that would be awesome. Yeah, I, th I think for me- um, I think also uh, uh, Curzon too. Yeah. Because he was, I feel like he was too young to understand that um, there was no one actually really fighting for him and him only. And it was kind of just him going based off of what he believed would lead him to freedom quickest. Right, right. He's very idealistic. And, yeah. and, and this, Isabel is very realistic, um, which made, which was fun for me as a writer because you have very opposing viewpoints in people who are friends and who, who, who learn to care about each other as friends. Um, there's Isabel, and then um, I, I do have a, 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 an interesting connection, not a connection, but the, I don't know if you guys remember her. She wasn't in the book very long. The elderly um, white woman who was the aunt of, of Mr. Lockton, right? So she was married to a man who was from a uh, Dutch background and she spoke a lot of languages. And she's the woman that Isabel rescues during the fire in September. And, and she winds up encouraging Isabel to run. And she says some really, you know, she's, I think she's such a great example of, of, a, of a white person who thinks, thinks they're doing great. Um, and uh, like, like, I, you know, I should have bought you, she says, thinking that that's, the, you know, because from her very limited perspective, and then we see a little tiny bit of growth of her at the end of her life, 
when she understands that no, being bought by a nice white person, that's not, that's not the answer. And that this child, this incredible young woman deserves and needs to go out and, and, and be free, like, like they are allegedly fighting this war for. So that's a, she's an interesting character, uh, very, very, very subtle, but yeah, Isabel's, whew, and she's my hero. She's so much braver than I am, so much braver than I am. Thank you. Um, Anaya, I know you had some questions regarding research. I feel like she already answered this question based off another. So I wanted to know if I can ask a different question that's not directly about the book. Go for it. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So my question was, you were basically saying how we needed to focus, if I heard you correctly, more on stories because textbooks are like I guess outdated I don't know if I was like understanding you wrong but why do you feel that they aren't like do you feel it do you feel the textbooks are just not useful and we need to have a whole new way of learning or you're just saying that we should look into using stories more in our way of like teaching and learning I, I think stories are one piece, and thank you for, for, for the question and, and the way you, you frame that. I appreciate that a lot. Um, from my perspective, and I'm not an educator, there's like hundreds of people on this call who could answer this question better than me. But let me tell you from my point of view, um, I think that most of the textbooks that I have seen when I was growing up, my kids were going to school, and even recently, I'm really not impressed with. I don't think they do a good, I think they try to do everything at once and that means they do nothing well. Um, uh, in the resource uh, packs, there's a bunch of, uh, there's much more information, much more interactive experiences that we can craft for young learners and young readers that will engage them, engage their curiosity and their passion and their sense of justice. Um, so they're going to understand the lesson so much more than, oh, I'm going to memorize these battles and, um, and then I'm just going to go back and play video games. You know, it's just ridiculous. People get upset when, when, when kids, you know, say, I don't like to read or whatever. Maybe we should give them things that they like reading. Um, that, that would probably solve that problem. So I do think that, that uh, stories, um, his, well-written, historically-based stories are a piece of that puzzle. Um, but we all have to honor and respect each student for where they are. There will be some students, I think, probably who would enjoy a textbook. I suspect more wouldn't. Um, and I, I'm so impressed with this current generation of educators is doing a much better job learning the different ways that their students learn um, and making sure that, that they are bringing to the table lots of different ways that kids can encounter the information and can, can examine it and engage with it. And I love that you asked that question um, because um, Isa too is actually going to bring us home and she actually had a question relating to generations and chains. All right. Thank you. So, I mean, as we know, um, the, the events that have been changed did happen a long time ago. And for that reason, it can be really hard for some of us to even imagine what life would be like then. Um, as much as we learn about it, it's, it's so hard to actually to, to believe like, okay, um, if this was now, then other people would have been enslaved. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that students of this generation, the ones reading your books, can relate not only to the characters, but also to the events that the characters are being affected by their struggles in your book? Oh, that's such a great, a great, great question. Thank you. Boy, that's like a dissertation yeah. right there. I, I think one of the things that I love the most about kids is that you guys are born with a sense of righteousness, of fairness. You know, I've got grandsons that are pretty young and the three-year-old, he knows what's fair um, and he knows what's not fair. And he's very happy to tell you about that. And too often the systems of the United States um, first of all, they too often, they, they, we don't have equity in education to put it mildly. Um, funding is not equitable. Funding is just, it doesn't exist. And that's actually a part of the system that that's not a, a bug. That's a feature. Um, and so there are so many inequities in the lives of students today. I think that if we can, we, I like it when people use my books as a mirror for today. 
I told a, I've told a couple different groups of teachers that if I was teaching American history, I would start with the Black Lives Matter movement and I would teach history backwards. Um, you and 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 show kids like well you know why why is the civil rights voting legislation um, why is that even being discussed and why was it put in place and what was it like when I was uh, graduating from high school um, there were still beaches in Florida that were segregated by skin color when I was born it was illegal for people of different races to marry in a majority of the states in the United States I was just telling my cousin today. Um, the last uh, ship that brought kidnapped Africans to the United States was a ship called the Clotilda, and it landed in 1860. This was after um, we were supposed to not be importing enslaved people anymore, but people were doing it illegally. There was a two-year-old girl on that ship. She, was on, she had been kidnapped along with her 10-year-old sister, <laughs> just these characters, right, and their mom. Thank goodness they were together with their mother. Uh, and they were sold into slavery in Alabama. This is 1860. Um, Miss, th that young girl uh, grew up and was, uh, didn't die until 1940. So this young child who was captured with her family and enslaved and then free, but then had to live through uh, reconstruction and Jim Crow in Alabama. Thankfully, she had a great family. She had a big family. Her, there was joy and love in her life. Um, but she was alive still in 1940. All of my, my, my brother-in-law was born in 1947. This is not even history. When you think about how affected all of you guys are by your grandparents and, and your great grandparents, you know, we we're not that far. It just happened. It might feel like a long time ago. And I, I blame those stupid paintings of rich people and the men in the white wigs and they just look so ridiculous. And you're just like, oh, what's up with that, right? So it can be hard to connect with them if you're just looking at pictures of, of the, the wealthy. And the, again, if you're only getting information from textbooks. But when we tell stories about people, that's when we go, oh my gosh, we can connect with them. Um, so I would, like I said, I would teach history backwards. I would go back to, to, to that ship in 1860 and all of the ships and the incredible, even in the North after slavery was abolished, um, white businesses and white business owners made bazillions of dollars off of the unfree labor that was still being held in the South. Um, these, are, these are facts on the ground and we have a choice as Americans about what kind of country do we want you guys to live in? What do we want? What do we want our legacy to be for our children and our grandchildren? Um, there is a lot of great lines in the Declaration of Independence and in the Massachusetts Constitution mentioned earlier by Ms. Butler. Um, and uh, I wanted to use those as, as, as our, our guiding lights and make it better finally, fulfill some of those promises instead of just mumbling them. All right, thank you all so much for our, our panel students. You have definitely just added, um, just elevated <laughs> this presentation. Just hearing your voices is so valued. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. We're gonna now pivot to this section of our presentation where we're actually going to give you some real time strategies of how you can actually um, incorporate using historical fiction in your classroom. Some actual tips you can leave this presentation and use immediately. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over um, to Lindsay and Jean. Alicia, thank you so much. And Lori, it was so incredible to hear from you. Um, I'm so excited tonight that we're helping teachers put your work into practice. Uh, Jean, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am really excited to pick your expertise a little bit more this evening to talk about how teachers can find both practical and meaningful ways to incorporate historical fiction into their classrooms. Uh, we all know that Lori is kind of the exemplar work of great historical fiction. Um, um, but there are a lot of other time periods to cover in history. Um, so Jean, I would love to get kind of some of your advice on what is the best way to get started with finding the right historical fiction books to use, especially teachers are trying to cover so much content. So how do we even get started finding these books? Jean, if you can unmute. 
Well, that was embarrassing. Um, if you don't read lips, I will tell you that I wanted to begin by saying thank you and how much I appreciated hearing you, Lori, share your perspectives and to hear from these future historians, these students that spoke. Um, I'd say as an educator, uh, former classroom teacher, and now as a school librarian, uh, that time is, um, time is probably the, one of the most stressful factors when it comes to um, dipping your toe in the water and exploring historical fiction, like Lori was saying, using historical empathy through storytelling. And um, a favorite resource that I have um, that I share with teachers all the time is a called Sora. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's a subscription-based program available to public schools and private schools across the country. And what's wonderful about it is that when your school has an account, which the majority of schools across the country do have, this gives educators and students access to tens of thousands of eBooks and audiobooks that you can um, peruse on your computer, on an e-reader, or on a phone. And so with that efficiency, you can, you know, from the comfort of your home or, um, a, you know, desk at school, take a look at the different options that are out there. And logging in is quite simple. Um, you can see in the screenshots, you know, you just do a simple login with your um, school ID. And then Sora offers these curated um, collections of different types of books. You can see right here for Massachusetts teachers, we have a new collection just on US historical fiction. Um, so you're welcome to just browse and take it all in. And then if you want something particular to look for, you can, um, for example, look up Chains and you can see that Sora offers the book both as an ebook and an audio book. Next slide, please. Okay, so before you commit to even borrowing a book, um, you can take a look at the, the beginning of the book. Um, you can browse it online. And this is perfect for teachers because as we all know, one size doesn't fit all. And so before you make that commitment to introduce a book or a series of books, you can um, read the beginning of the book to get a sense of it's the just right fit. Or what I really recommend is engaging with an audiobook component. Um, it's it, it's almost like, well, um, when I re-listened to Chains recently and I heard the voice narrator, Bonnie Chirpin speak, she um, invokes this sort of, um, she has this talent to share, you know, multiple convincing character voices as she's reading aloud each chapter. She has this intuitive timing that enhances Isabel's story. And when you're using audiobooks in a classroom, you have a voice narrator that offers a relationship with the listener to suspend their disbelief. It isn't you, the teacher speaking. It's almost like there's a third entity in the room. And so having Sora, um, which again is a school-based um, reading app is just a great way to explore these fantastic titles that are being published today. Next slide. Okay, so buckle, buckle up everyone. I'm very excited about this. When I heard that I would be um, participating on this webinar, I put out an APB to all the school librarians across um, Massachusetts here. And I asked them to share their tried and true list of historical fiction novels that they've had great success with when they're co-planning units with classroom teachers. And so um, this list will be provided to participants at the end of the, um, uh, following the webinar. And what we've done is we've taken these different historical eras and then we've matched up both middle grade and young adult historical fiction texts that complement the, um, the content. So it's a great way if you're, wanting to explore a particular time period, say the Great Depression. I mean, without a doubt, reading Karen Hess's uh, novel and verse, Out of the Dust is a must. Um, and this is an ongoing project for us. So please um, check in, especially at the end of the summer, it'll be a growing list. And I'm even seeing in the comments here, some school librarians across the country sharing their titles, um, which I'm excited to, to add. It, it's a great living document. Um, so that's one place that you can go to narrow down books based on your search. 
So that's awesome. So you're giving us not only a book list, so we can kind of have a Mm -hmm. cheat sheet of good curated sources that we would recommend for historical fiction, and then also ways to um, obtain the historical fiction in case you can't get a classroom set. Um, You could have your students listen to the audio book. They could read it on Sora. That is really, that's fantastic. Um, So now that we've narrowed down, we're figuring out the books that we want to use, what are some strategies or guidance that you might have or suggestions that you can offer to teachers so they can seamlessly integrate a work of historical fiction into their classroom without completely rewriting their entire curriculum? One thing that we love to do in my district is something called um, First Chapter Fridays. We're doing it at the middle school level. And this is where teachers can tap into Sora and they can select a variety of historical fiction texts from a particular time period. And then, you know, Friday morning, we're, we're all ready to switch it up and transition to the weekend. And there's something really um, fun and refreshing about listening to a different first chapter from a different historical fiction book each week. And what's, what's really powerful about this is that this gives students opportunities, not only to see themselves as readers, but to, to see themselves as historical fiction readers. So I definitely encourage that. Um, You'll see on the right hand side of the screen, um, this is something called a book snap. Now this is created by an educator named Tara Martin. And she wanted to harness the um, young adult passion around social media and use it to help students um, analyze texts that they're reading in school and connect it to their own life. And you don't need social media to do this. We, I don't recommend that, but with you know something as simple as a Google slide or a PowerPoint, students can take a book that they've read either as a class or independently, and they can share out um, a portion of the text that really spoke to them and they can annotate it. They can connect in their own language, you know, what it is that resonated with them. You can get playful with students and you can, you know, include emojis and things like that. But the book snaps have been highly successful because they're they're sparking a student empathy and imagination and they're developing student social emotional skills and they're able to breathe their own perspective into the story that they're reading. And that's something that we've been hearing about a lot tonight, creating a sense of connectivity between stories of the past and our, and our own stories. Um, and that's a, just a really strong way to make meaning. I also recommend, um, it's very low stakes, but incorporating art whenever you can in the classroom, doing scene illustrations. It's surprising how something as simple as, um, let's say if you are, focusing on a particular theme in a book, having kids, even if it's bell work, just to sketch out um, a scene that they've read recently that they think connects to the theme in a story. And what that does is it makes students thinking visible, right? And it helps us understand what they are gleaning from the text or maybe some points that um, haven't come through yet. And I've seen teachers get really creative with illustrations, even cutting up like four by four pieces of um, copy paper, having kids illustrate or collage, and then making class quilts that they hang up. Um, Students can even put those together. You know, the onus certainly shouldn't be on the teacher for that. But there are very, um, you know, simple artistic ways to bring these types of um, stories alive. Okay, so we have a lot of great discussion questions here that you can use for oral discussions. They can be used for writing prompts. And I'll just direct your attention to the last question at the bottom of this page. And again, we'll, you know, you'll be receiving all of this um, following the webinar. Um, this question's about historical events and having students reflect on the text that they're reading and imagining how things would be different at that historical time period if uh, today's technology was accessible back then. And I find that students really love this question because life even before cell phones is really unimaginable. And it gives them this space to engage and think about the story critically, especially when it comes to the science and technology components of communication. Um, 
And it's, it's really, it's surprising how these little kernels of awareness and understanding can help students um, get a bigger sense of a story or an author's message. And then they can further apply it on to future historical eras that they're studying as well. And then in terms of lesson ideas, um, we find that the more students can enter um, a historical fiction novel, having background knowledge, of course, the better, right? It's, these nuances can make the, the story um, the story experience more engaging. And instead of putting the responsibility on the teacher to scramble and find that background knowledge, we really encourage you to work with your school librarians or library media specialists and have them introduce or reintroduce databases. And I heard Lori speaking about this earlier, the importance of trustworthy, reliable, accurate information. And by giving students, you know, just a short assignment where they're responsible for learning about, gathering information about a particular historical time period through a database, and then packaging and sharing out that information either um, in small groups or in a larger setting, it helps the students develop that foundation that they then can apply when they're reading a book. And then that sparks such joy too when, they, when they've done the work, if you will, and then they see the results in the types of stories that they're reading. Um, further along, we also, we love the idea of connecting, especially social studies teachers, current events, with historical fiction. And when you can apply a creative uh, writing element to it, again, you're creating this personal engagement with students. So one activity, uh, whether it's in school or the homework assignment can be around student um, opinion. And so having a student think about from a character's perspective, how might a character feel about a current event? You could do this assignment certainly through the, less, uh, the lens of social justice, right? So what would Sal think about the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, would she be surprised in early 250 years later? We're at where we're at, we are at where we're at as a nation. Um, it gives a lot of space for students to, to wonder. Um, you can also offer students the opportunity of, to go at it at a different angle and think about, um, you know, historically the lens of appearance. Um, Lindsay, you and I were, were laughing recently, uh, reflecting on that scene in Chains where you have, you know, um, this woman, Madame Watson, she has the getting ready for this big dinner and she has the mouth fur, she blew the mouth fur um, on to enhance her eyebrow. and. You know, it'd be interesting to to have a character, whether it be her or Sal, wonder about, you know, current day, like our cultural obsession with appearance and is this surprising? Is this to be expected? So you can really do, you can dovetail current events and, um, and then events from the past. And then lastly, it really comes down to the details, right? We have a graphic organizer that can be used while students are listening to a chapter or reading it independently. And this gives the space for students to explore all these like delicious historical facts that are artfully tucked into really great historical fiction. Um, so if I think about it, um, for me with Chains, when you have the invasion of New York and you have, you know, Lady Seymour so upset um, following the invasion that there weren't any bells tolling following the attack. And then we learn, of course, that's because the bells are melted into cannons. These tiny little nuggets just reveal the ingenuity of the people of the time and, and this total disruption that war can bring to a daily life. And it's, it's through these small um, details that you create this like three-dimensional reading experience. And so the more we can have students stop and reflect, um, see themselves and share their opinions in what they're reading, the more it cements their learning and their understanding. It's, um, it's, just, it's a really exciting time to be in young adult literature when we're um, wedding history and the present. 
Jean, thank you so much. These are just such fabulous ways to build empathy and make history come alive for students. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia. She's gonna walk us through some specific primary source examples and historical cases um, to help you use chains in the classroom. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. I love the idea of first, uh, first chapter Fridays. Um, I can't, I definitely can't wait to use that in my classroom. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so I just wanted to give you some um, quick ideas, additional ideas of how you can um, bring chains into your classroom and how you can also pair it um, with uh, studying and analyzing um, primary sources and real life people. Um, so my first example actually comes in that of Belinda Royale. Um, Belinda Royale, uh, her owner, had been ex exiled to England and he granted her freedom and his will. And he left instructions to pay her actually for her service. It's actually a remarkable story. So in 1783, she actually petitioned requesting pension for herself and her daughter and she got it. Um, I love this story because it's taking place during the American Revolution, but it has a happy ending, which is completely unlike the story of Isabel and Ruth, at least in that first book. Um, and so I thought a, a great idea, um, you know, would be to pair these. Belinda's former owner's instructions were respected, whereas the characters and chains were not. So how can we bring this together in the classroom? Next slide. Great activity would, would be uh, to just have the students compare Belinda Royal's experience with Isabel's um, and have them you know, discuss as a group why was there a different outcome. Um, but also you can um, have the students discuss what insight does this give you into the institution of slavery during the revolution and enslaved people's ability to actually rely upon the court system to protect their rights. So we have two stories, all right? One's a factual story and one's historical fiction, but being able to pair them both to really form a more complete idea of what the experiences were for Black people, enslaved people during the American Revolution. Can we go to the next slide? So runaway uh, slave ads, uh, I have to admit that I absolutely love use, using them in my classroom as a primary source. There's so many different databases that are out there. Um, and I think one of the things that we have a tendency to do as educators is that when we do use runaway slave ads, we kind of pigeonhole ourselves into one particular era, right? You know, maybe right before the Civil War or kind of like the mid 1800s. We're forgetting that there are actually runaway slave ads that we do have out there at our fingertips um, that actually are focused in the colonial period, in the period of the American Revolution. Hence my example here. Um, this was a, um, a runaway slave ad from, I think it was 1783. Um, and it actually is focused on um, a, a, an enslaved woman who ran away um, living in um, New York at the time. And the reason why I love using this is because they can be used to show us snapshots into the experiences of enslaved women in particular. Um, and historical fiction can offer even more in-depth look into the stories that extend over the entire course of the war. Can we go to the next slide? Now the problem is oftentimes when we do use these runaway slave ads, um, we don't allow our students and we don't train our students to read between the lies to be able to construct an image or understanding of the personality of the, the, the person that ran away. So some questions that we could be looking at with our students to really keep the focus on them. All right. What did she look like using the example of the runaway slave ad? How old was she when she ran away? These are basic knowledge one level questions. Was she alone? What hardships or obstacles do you think she endured while on the run? What factors do you think assisted her while she was on the run? If you've taught a lesson about the American Revolution, you can have the students kind of use their background information of what they understand New York was like to better understand why this young woman, Sarah, was able to run away or took the, that, that particular you know, year uh, to, to, to try to claim her freedom. How did the conditions of the city caused by the American Revolution impact her ability to escape slavery. The penalty from runaways was increasingly severe during the revolution. What does this reveal about her personality and the conditions of her servitude? So now we're being able to use these words, but we're reading between the lines and helping our students kind of reconstruct an idea of who this woman was, right? And how the American revolution gave her the opportunity to, to run away and claim her freedom. Can we go to the next slide? So how do we pair this with chains then, right? Well, one great way to do this was to have students use these very same discussion questions that I just presented to you, right? Have them answer these questions again 
right? But this time have them answer them um, to try to like use Ruth and Isabel's experience, right? So these same questions, but now instead of asking these questions of Sarah, the person in the runaway slave ad, use these same questions to answer um, and to reconstruct the experience of Ruth and Isabel. What if they ran away, right? How would you answer these questions for them? Another activity for this, students can write an interview with Ruth and Isabel um, or a memoir for them or a newspaper article about them. Or students can use the questions as the basis for a drawing or other graphic depiction of Ruth and Isabel's lives. Um, and you can definitely modify the question slightly to fit the format that they choose. So once again, using a runaway slave at to actually, you know, really reconstruct the life of someone that did choose to run away, a woman at that, um, but also pairing that um, with trying to use those same questions to, to answer um, the experience of Ruth and, and Isabel. Next slide. Um, I love the story of Mary Perth. Uh, Mary Perth, once again, a real live enslaved woman at the time. She was living in Norfolk, Virginia in 1776. She got uh, separated from her enslaver. She ran away to New York. She took the opportunity during the revolution to claim her own freedom. And she, we think that she most likely lived and worked for the British army as a domestic while she was in New York. And at the end of the war, she, along with so many other black people fled New York for Nova Scotia, where she experienced social and economic inequality and eventually resettled in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Um, and so, you know, not all enslaved people sided and aided the patriots uh, like Curzon, right? At least in the first book, we know that actually much more Black pit people actually joined the British, like Mary Perth. So you can bring in her experience as well. Next slide. Well, particularly with her, um, you can have students do a Venn diagram, compare Mary Perth, a real life, you know, woman during the American Revolution. How did her choices, her background, her experience compare uh, with Isabel and Ruth? That's a way to bring in both together. Um, another great activity, um, I love using rafts in class. I think it's an opportunity to be creative, a role audience format. Um, and doggone it, I, uh, <laughs> I forgot what the T stood for again, uh, topic I think, right? Um, you can have the students write a letter from Mary Perth um, after you explain to her situation and you know her, her life choices and her experiences. Have the students write a letter from, from her to Isabel and Ruth um, and have Mary give Isabel and Ruth advice um, about you know, how to carry on through the American Revolution based upon um, Mary's experiences during the war. So it's just a great way to, to pair a real life person with the characters in chains. Next slide. And then you can't forget Phyllis Wheatley, right? You know, Phyllis Wheatley, oftentimes I feel like, you know, we introduce her during Black History Month and that's all you hear about her, right? And sometimes we don't even really do that. Um, although she herself was enslaved, she was one of the most well-known poets of her time. She was seized, seized from Gambia at the age of seven. She was brought to Boston. She worked as a domestic and was taught to read and write. An exceptional poet. She wrote a series of 28 poems by the time she was 18. Um, and what I love about her is that during the Revolutionary War, she used her poetry to highlight the hypocrisy of fighting for freedom while denying liberty to the enslaved. So how can we bring in Phyllis Wheatley and study change at the same time? Next slide. Well, a great example of doing that is have students read and analyze one of Wheatley's poems and then have students write a short poem from the point of view of any of the enslaved characters in Chains. And I love this because like I said, my, my, my student um, Bethlehem, she was saying she really loved, you know, the ghosts in the story, right? And I myself love the presence of the mother um, in Chains, right? And even though, that, you know, she is deceased, have the opportunity to still give her a voice, allow the students to give her a voice through a poem, right? So have the students write a short poem from the point of view of any of the characters in Chains, the enslaved um, characters, whether they're alive or deceased, um, and have them highlight their experiences during the Revolutionary War. So hopefully these are some great activities um, that you can use. You can still teach primary sources, real life people, and also pair it with chains together to really make sure that students are getting a, a, a whole picture and a complete narrative of the experience of the enslaved during the Revolutionary War. And now Sue is going to come on and tell us a little bit more about the U.S. collection on PBS Learning Media. Great. Thanks a lot, Alicia. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sue Wilkins, and I'm the Director of Social Studies uh, Education at GBH. And I'm going to take a few minutes here at the end to share with you a new collection of U.S. history resources for middle and high school teachers and their students. This collection has been in development for several years, uh, and it is a curated set of supplemental 
media rich resources uh, that we will be fully launching for the upcoming 2022-23 school year. Next slide, please. Great, um, and we can go to the next slide. So we have three broad goals for this collection. Um, our first goal is to create a site where US history teachers can and will want to return throughout their course. We know that history teachers regularly use media and that media helps bring the past to life for students and engages them in the content. And to facilitate teachers use of the collection, we've organized resources by both era, and we have 16 different eras in the collection, and by skill, we have nine historical thinking skills. Um, we know that most teachers plan curriculum chronologically by era, and we'll have resources to cover core US history topics across all 16 eras and subtopics. Next slide, please. To achieve this second goal of the US history collection, and I think this really uh, reflects a lot of what we've been discussing tonight, we, um, we have elevated multiple perspectives where the media allows us to do so. Uh, there are different definitions right now as to what multiple perspectives means, and our definition is here on the slide. Alongside the vast number of collection resources that focus on traditional or core topics and themes, we have many resources in the collection that highlight lesser known historic voices, perspectives, and actions um, that all serve to broaden the traditional historical narrative. Resources are in the collection are aligned with at least uh, two of the nine historical thinking skills we feature in the collection. Historical thinking skills are elevated in new independent student activities that guide students to use the media resource to explore a skill in more depth. Uh, we know that in addition to content, history teachers are required to teach skills. So this is one way we support that work. And then we've heard repeatedly from teachers and students that media is a regular expectation in the history classroom. It engages students in new and different ways. It helps bring the past to life, as I'm sure you know. It facilitates connections between the past and present. It really is an important tool in a teacher's toolbox, and it's a real strength for GBH and public media. Next slide, please. To achieve this third goal for the US History Collection, we have developed many, many elements. Um, I've mentioned historical thinking skills. One of those is developing civic understanding and engagement. Um, Youth Stand Up is GBH Education Civic Engagement Project, and it includes both standalone videos of past and present uh, civic youth leaders, as well as a civic action project curriculum for middle school students. Why It Matters is um, a series of seven new original videos that connect the past and the present on a particular topic, and they link classroom learning to everyday life and civic issues. Topics in production so far include what you're seeing on the screen here, um, sports and protest. We've, uh, we are creating one about fashion and politics and one about Alcatraz and Native American history. And then there will be four more in addition to those. And then uh, you decide interactive lessons. These present students with familiar historic debates, at least familiar to you teachers out there and um, ask them to decide uh, based on the content that they've learned. And you'll see a little bit more about that in just a minute. Next slide, please. So we're creating a, a lot of new resources for the collection. You're seeing here pages from three new interactive lessons. Um, an interactive lesson on PBS Learning Media is a student-facing self-paced digital lesson. There are 10 to 12 pages in length usually and they contain a variety of media and activities for students. Um, here's one of the You Decides on the left uh, that we've developed. This one asks whether students think Washington or Du Bois had a more effective strategy for improving the lives of African-Americans at the turn of the century. Um, there's one on Truman's decision to use atomic weapons to end the war with Japan. Uh, and there's one on whether uh, the, the, the so-called Roaring Twenties is an appropriate moniker for the decade. Uh, no matter the topic, each lesson presents students with evidence on both sides of the debate. And then as a historian would, students are asked to evaluate the evidence and decide how they would answer uh, the lesson's essential question. Next uh, slide, please. 
Um, and finally, we're creating new interactive maps, timelines, and images for the collection. And you're seeing here um, a screenshot from an interactive image where students can explore this famous painting. There will be an introduction slide that will give students historical context. And then students can then click into those boxes that you see what we call hotspots. Um, and when they click there, they're taken to another page where they might engage with additional text or additional images, or even they might watch a video uh, to learn more about the image. So we will develop student activities to accompany all of these new interactives so that teachers um, have at least an option for how to use the resource in the classroom. All right, and next slide, please. Um, and then the last thing I, I want to mention about the collection is that all of our resources are accompanied by support materials. We really want to create a collection that has a very consistent look and feel uh, for teachers and students. So for teachers, we will have uh, every resource will have teaching tips. And you see there uh, what is in teaching tips, but it's essentially to make our thinking about the resource and how you might use it with your students very, very clear. Um, and then for students, we have uh, background readings. These are two to three page readings that provide historical context. They all have an essential question. They all have subheadings, visuals, and vocabulary embedded in them. Um, every resource has discussion questions, higher order uh, criti critical thinking questions that accompany the media. And then about half of the collection resources will have uh, these independent student activities that elevate one of these nine historical thinking skills in a clear student activity designed to require minimal teacher direction, if any at all. So we're working hard. We're super excited about this collection. And I please hope that, um, that you will look for it this fall when you return uh, after, your, after your summer break uh, and return to the classroom. Thanks so much. I'm gonna turn things back over to Carolyn. Wow, thank you one and all. If the panelists uh, want to um, just look through the chat and see if there are any questions that you can respond to. I mentioned earlier that we will be looking at the chat. We have your questions also that you posted in the registration form and we'll compile some themes of questions and Lori will respond to those offline and you will get uh, her responses. Um, uh, I'm not gonna make a promise about when, but let's say within the next 10 days or so. Um, we are running a little over, so I'm just gonna very quickly remind you that PBS Learning Media is the free site where you can find thousands of resources. And this is where the new US history collection will live when it is fully published at the end of the summer. But meanwhile, right now, there are thousands of resources for you to discover. And here are just some examples of the collections that you'll find on the site. You will get a link to the recording, the resource folder, which includes a resource document that is very comprehensive about everything that we referenced tonight a separate document of all the book recommendations and also a wonderful document that Lori Halls Anderson has put together of reading materials, uh, recommendations, websites, et cetera. Please help us do better. This is the survey link. Um, when you close out of the browser, the survey should pop up automatically. It's fairly brief. It's monitored by our research department. It can be anonymous. You can download a certificate of completion after you've finished it. We pay very close attention to your comments. And we have something that um, is brand new that I wanted to um, offer to you. We will be doing a research study this fall around the resources in the new US history collection. And we are looking for teachers to participate in that research study. So if you have an interest, you teach US history and you have an interest in learning more about this, there is a link here on the screen. It's also in the resource document for you to uh, just answer a couple of questions, give us your contact information, and we'll make sure that you get details as we get closer to the time. 
Uh, we do a lot of webinars, and this is the first in the series. Uh, the, our session tonight was number two. This was number one. You'll have the recording link to that and the resource document for that. I don't know if Larry Pasca is still on the line or not. He okay. is. Do you want to say a quick hi for your uh, conference coming up, which we are very excited about going to? Thank you. And, and, and again, Lori, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating tonight. So if you loved what you learned this evening, historical fiction, empathy, inquiry, please come to our 102nd annual conference. We will be in one of uh, America's strongest historical cities, right? Historical Cultural Significance, Philadelphia, December 2nd through 4th. Please join us over 500 sessions. We are focused deeply on inquiry. GBH Education and other partners will be there, of course. We're always proud to, to welcome literally thousands of you from across the country and, and countries around the world. So please visit us now, socialstudies.org forward slash conference. And if you have questions at any time, just look us up at socialstudies.org. We're happy to answer your questions and welcome you into our community of social studies learners. So again, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. And it's been a pleasure to be with you tonight. I learned a lot and I'm excited to share this and, and many more sessions with you in just a few months. Thank you very much, Larry, and thank you to everyone. If the present the presenters who are still on the call, if you want to come back on camera, um, thank you to the social studies team, Sue, Lindsay, and Alicia, to our wonderful students. Uh, we had three students, all eleventh graders. Jean, the librarian, has a wealth of resources for you in that resource folder, and a particular thank you to Lori. Thank you very, very much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and working with you and learning from you. And Lori mentioned that she is going to be at the NCSS conference. She's uh, presenting um, at a session, and we are going to be there in full regalia. We have a booth, we have multiple sessions, and we really look forward to meeting you, and we're thrilled to be back somewhere in person. My hometown, Philadelphia, can't wait. Okay, um, we're right at the very end of our time. I'm sorry that we didn't have more time for just open Q&A, but again, if your questions are posted in the chat or you email me, um, and then the questions are also that you uh, put into the registration form, uh, they will not be ignored. Thank you to all of you. I wish you a wonderful um, respite for the summer. Um, it's been a rough year, we know, and we applaud your dedication and all that you do for students and families. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'll keep the chat open for another couple of minutes. Um, if you'd like to let us know what you thought about tonight, uh, we'd love to hear that. We get a kick out of feedback right away that we read in the morning or tonight. And um, thank you again to everyone. If anyone has any final remarks while we just keep the chat open, please feel free to chime in. Okay, I will, um, you have my contact information. You are welcome to email me with any comments or questions. I'll get it to the right people. Have a wonderful summer teachers, uh, staff. Hope, wait to, <laughs> hope to see you in the office someday or maybe in Philadelphia. That'll be the next time we see each other in person. Um, thank you again. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to close out the webinar now. Thank you.